I love this bit. We get we get lots of people coming very quickly to the uh, uh, to the to the meeting space. Yeah, so I, I get to read down this this list of people who've joined us. So we've got Barbara Osborne, Carly Mason, uh, Catherine Doe. Nice to see you, uh, Dan Fletcher. <laughs> he he works with us. Haylock Haylock uh, Hazel, Helen Hamilton, uh, Jennifer Taylor, uh, Jay. Nice to see you, Catherine Archer, Lisa Gardner. It's just great to see Nick Goulding and, and everybody on the list here. So we'll wait, we'll wait a, about another minute, uh, just see if anybody else is going to join us. And also, um, I was going to say we can we can just introduce ourselves in a couple of seconds, Marcus, can't we? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And we, we're going to have a bit of we're going to try and have a bit of uh, you know backwards and forwards banter between the two of us. We've got a couple of Slido things for you. So in other words, questions that we can ask and and you can give us feedback. And then we're uh, thinking that we might well stay a little bit longer at the end so that effectively everybody or people can just stay and have a chat if they want. Yeah. Particularly as we never quite seem to get around to everyone's questions for the end of these and everyone has to shoot off at five. But if anyone wants to hang around, then we get a chance to, to go into your questions in a bit more detail or get to those we didn't get around to. Cool. So, so uh, Marcus and myself have got about uh, 40 minutes worth of talk, and then we go into questions afterwards. And as, as I've just said, Marcus and myself will stay for a little bit longer. So if you've got any questions, you can ask those going uh, forward. So I, I'm, I'm Mark Salway. I'm the Managing Director for uh, MKS Fundraising and Management. Uh, my interest in cost recovery goes back 20, 21 years. And as I put out on, on my LinkedIn post, it's really been a labor of love over 20 years because nobody seems to talk about this thing, which is so important for charities, yeah, uh, which is costing and then secondly, pricing. So we're going to we're going to talk about that today. How do you how do you cost your services and, and how do you price them uh, properly? And we're just going to have a bit of fun with it. So, so I mean, Marcus, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Sure. So my name's Marcus Lees Millet, and I am um, a manager within the finance team of More Kings of Smith Fundraising and Management. Um, I have only been at More Kings of Smith for less than less than six months. Um, prior to that, I was at Cass Business School for a couple of years and at PwC before that, where I trained as an auditor for my sins. So I know all about costs. Yeah. So, so we, we're going to have the most fun you can have with cost recovery this afternoon. And it's, it, it, can be a, it can be a fairly dry subject, so we're going to try and make it, you know, lively for you with a couple of anecdotes, uh, you know, to, to, to help you along. So, so I, wanted to, I wanted to start by framing today's, uh, you know, workshop, and then we're going to do a little introduction to MKS, and then Marcus is going to start to take you through some of the detail about cost recovery. It was, it was 20 years ago, um, and I was working at KPMG, and I was work at the, at the time I was... Uh, costing Virgin Airlines, cleaning companies, you know, I was working with pharmaceutical companies and somebody said, would you, would you go and have a look at a charity? Yeah. And I said, fine, I, I'm, I'm happy to go and have a look at, at costing a charity. So I went to ActionAid and um, ActionAid is a great charity, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I love what they did. And somebody said, what, what, what do you think of our cost recovery? And, and, you know, what do you think of the practice? And, you know, how we do it and, and what do you think of our business model? And I said, I, I'm, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, I don't get it. Yeah, I, I don't get your, your business model because you're not making uh, a profit on any of your services. Well, hang on, you're not for profit. You, you're not even covering your costs. And then you're having to go out into the street to get door to door and face to face fundraisers to give you that money to plug a gap which a donor was happy to pay in in the first place. So forgive me, I, I don't get your, uh, your business model. And it, and it was funny because it led to a real step change in ActionAid where they got in the fundraising team, they got in the ops team, and they got in the finance team, and they got them to talk together, which is kind of revolutionary. You know, a, a chance where three different parties come together to maximize doing business in a, in a more commercial way. And we're not talking about impact here. You know, imp impact is, sits over here. We're talking about the money and just making sure you've got the money to deliver. Mm. And, and then I took that um, piece of work to Worcester and a community volunteer service in Worcester. And it was, it was, it was funny because they had a £300,000 grant. They had a gap of somewhere around 10%, which the local authority wouldn't fund. And um, so I sat there and, you know, um, 
belligerent that I am, I said, fine, if you won't give us the money, we'll cut off the phone. And uh, they said, that's ridiculous. And I said, no, you haven't given us the money for the phone. You know, th those are our overheads. Um, so, so please, if you give us the money, we won't have to send you a letter. And the person from the local authority said, I, I just think this is, this is crazy. I said, well, we will have to cut off the phone. They said, okay, we'll give you the extra money. How much do you need? And I said, well, I need about 2,000, 3,000 a year. And he just said, there's the money, yeah? We, we, we now believe you because you're being transparent. So what, what, I, wanted to, what I wanted to just frame this with, and, and the final thought for you is, is where I was working at Care International, we had a whole of 26 million US dollars at the, at the center of the organization. And we drove that ruthlessly down to about 8 million US dollars through better cost recovery practice. Um, so I leave you with two thoughts, uh, you know, before well, I start the whole uh, talk <laughs> with two thoughts. Um, one is that, you know, actually, if you just get the numbers organized and you're able to tell your story, people can then fund. And secondly, is to be transparent, because if you're not being transparent, people just won't trust you in these conversations. So that's what we're going to talk about today. As I say, we're going to we're going to have a bit of fun with it as, as uh, you know, along along the way. Just two seconds before we actually get to the main talk, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about MKS, more Kingston Smith. I mean, I joined Moore Kingston Smith because of our charity expertise, because um, most of the people I was meeting had worked in different charities before, not just been advisors. And, you know, I'm, 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 I really love the entrepreneurial spirit. I love the fact that we've got 14 charity specialist partners and, you know, this, this huge network so we can do overseas you know, work as well. And the team that I lead, um, there's three different angles to it. There's, there's an impact specialist uh, area. You know, they can do a lot on impact modeling, stakeholder engagement. So, for example, with COVID-19, they can, they can talk about impact from the positive as well as the negative. They can ask, um, you know, what, what is the change that's been made with new services that have come off the back of COVID-19, for example. Um, the fundraising team, Dan, Emma, um, funding reviews, strategic fundraising support, strategy in case for support reviews, you know, really powerful work that they're doing. Um, and then the good finance or financial management work that Marcus and myself are leading, which we're going to talk about today, financial models, scenario planning, cost, cost recovery, um, et cetera. And in terms of cost recovery, we typically look to getting a good five to 10% more for your money. Yeah you know, off the back of the work that we do. But I've probably stolen Marcus's thunder. I'm so, so, I'm so sorry. I'm now going to pass on to Marcus for, for the start of the cost recovery um, workshop. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. And I'm just going to move us on to the next slide here. So cost recovery. I think most of you who've joined this webinar probably have an idea in your mind of what you think cost recovery is. And I'm just going to make sure that we're all uh, singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were. So. The definition we're going to be using here of cost recovery is ensuring that a fair portion of your overheads are, are funded through each of your grants and contracts. And then full cost recovery would be if you manage to get that funding um, across your whole organization, all of your overheads are, are covered and that would be full cost recovery. So why is understanding your cost base important? Now, there are, we've got three reasons up here as to as to why you should understand your cost base, which this comes way before you even do cost recovery itself. Um, in order to be able to recover your costs, you've got to know what those costs are. So point number one, um, in order to run themselves effectively, um, if you're making decisions about the um, viability of your businesses, which, um, which services you want to be growing, shrinking, starting, stopping, etc., you need to know what your costs are going to be. I'm sorry, I'm just going to find whoever that is within there. And yeah, it's Vanessa, them. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, so as I was saying, in order to be able to run yourselves effectively, if you um, are wanting to look at your different services and saying, okay, which ones do I want to be scaling up? Which ones do I need to be scaling back, potentially? Um, you need, to, you need to be knowing what, what costs you're talking about in, the, in those different buckets. To focus on sustainability, to know whether your services are actually viable for the future. Um, how are you going to know that if you don't know what they cost? I, I'm sure everyone could tell you how much income they get for each of their different services, what their grants are. 
but the actual costs that sit against that income is maybe a different story. And the last one there um, is, a, is a two pronged one which is all about transparency, which if there's one thing you take away from this workshop, it would be that transparency is absolutely key in costing a cost recovery. So as I say there, it's um, to help in discussions with funders and management about the true cost of providing your services or outputs. Um, so this is an internal and an external thing. Um, you're letting your management know what your services really cost so that when you can see what your grants and contracts are, are bringing in against that, you can see if you have a gap that needs funding and then management can sign off on that gap and choose to, to fund that service um, to fill that funding gap if they so need. And externally, to be showing those, um, those funders the true cost of the work that you're doing. As Mark said just before, going back to someone and saying, well, actually, that's not covering all of our costs. We can't pay for our phones or something like that. If you haven't got all of the costs really laid out in a transparent manner, you don't quite have the, um, the, the full ammunition there to have a really open dialogue with, with a funder. And to give you a bit of context then for, for the, um, I suppose, the environment that, we're, that we've been working in is um, over the past decade or so, there's been a real, um, I'd say, problem in the sector where there's this perceived need to be seen to be as lean and cheap as possible. Um, and so many charities that we've been working with and others that we've just heard about in, in the news and through and through colleagues, etc., have been cutting their overheads as it's one of the easy things to, to scale back on. Um, because, you know, you don't want to stop the work that you're doing. You can't afford to stop your fundraising. So we'll cut overheads. But there's also a slightly more, um, I guess, insidious bit here where it's not necessarily that overheads are actually being cut, they're just being, um, the numbers are being juggled within financial statements to make charities appear cheaper, to make it seem like their overheads are the lowest of the low. And that then becomes a sort of competition where uh, one particular example we had was um, children's charities in the northeast of England. And one of them had 15% overheads. They all had 15% overheads because they no one wanted to seem to be the more expensive of the charities. One of them broke ranks and went to 14% overheads and suddenly all the others changed their reports and accounts as well. And the next year they all had 14 as well. And then 13 and so on. And you then become your own worst enemies because funders then expect to see those, those figures. If you're the charity that's still on 15 when everyone else is on 13, Funders expect you to be on 13 because why wouldn't you be? Everyone else is. And so this circle here just shows you how um, over the past decade or so, this cycle, this um, this starvation cycle, as it, as it has been labeled, has really been taking place. And so charities overheads have been um, getting lower and lower and lower as um, as they feel this need to conform to being as, as lean um, as possible as organizations. And we're so, now so reaching Marcus, the point. Yes, I was. I was going to. I was going to say we were. Gonna, we said we'd jump in on each other today and have a bit of fun. Yeah. So, so I, I was going to say, um, you know, th there's there's also some people's reality is actually the level of overheads is not important because they're having to manage on spot contracts and things like that. You know. So in other words, you're having to manage on um, the contract uh, value that that is the lowest. In other words, they've got to make sure that uh, they're putting forward a, a spot rate which the local authority or the CCG, for example, will, will, will take. Mm. And, and that's, that's the problem here when you've got a race to the bottom and you actually don't know your overheads. Yeah. yeah? You're, you're, stabbing, you're stabbing in the dark, aren't you? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very true point. Sorry, I didn't mean no, to interrupt. Go for it. So to put this into context of having, say, local authorities saying that they will accept certain amounts, this is a real example of a charity that we've worked with who their local authority said, um, you know, we're, we're accepting a, a bid for this for this um, for this grant. And the charity put in at 7% overheads because they felt that that's what would be reasonable to the to the local authority. However, this charity's actual overheads were 19% or there or thereabouts. And this instantly isn't transparent to the funder because if they went into your the charity's reports and accounts to, to check what they were, they're actually showing 4% in their reports and accounts. We've got three different figures here 
they've put in for 7%, their actual overheads are 19%, but in their reports and accounts, they're 4%. So to that local authority, you look like you've over submitted because your reports say 4%, but you've put in for 7 But in actual fact, you've got a 12% gap there, 7% and 19%. And on this bid of £300,000 for this particular charity, that meant that they had a 12% loss on that one bid, £36,000 gap that needs to be funded from, from elsewhere. And this is just a real example of how if you're not being truthful and transparent about what it really costs you to run your services, then you're going to have gaps like this gap here, where this charity had £36,000 that they needed to fund from elsewhere. And that, you know, whether you fund that from fundraising or from your unrestricted reserves or something like that, we all know that the moment that unrestricted reserves are becoming more and more important, they're like gold dust at the moment. And so this just really puts into context why you should know your um, no costs going into your services. But there's also the point there of reports and accounts and being transparent there where more and more funders are beginning to look at um, reports and accounts and comparing those to what you've put in with your bids for. Um, so I think the idea of trying to make yourselves appear as cheap as possible in your reports and accounts when the reality may be different is not necessarily a um, it's not a self-serving interest because in actual fact, that means that the local authority is going to have unrealistic expectations of what overhead percentage to be giving you. So, so as a quick spot question, go for it, Mark. You take over and I will paste in. No, I, I, I was, I was, I was going to like sort of do that. I just wanted to come back though to Remi, Remi, Remedios, Remedios. Uh, who, who, who's made a comment in the chat bar, quite often funders will only uh, take 10 or 12% of central overheads. What happens when your overheads are 20%? Yeah. And I think this is the most common question, you know, that we see. Yeah. When, when you've got um, 20%, you've got two things going on. As Marcus has just said, one is that you're reporting openly in your reports and accounts. So if you, if you actually go forward at a bid at a different rate, that's a real problem. Yeah. So, so then you are into what Mark has said, which is starting to slide your costs around. And that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of this call, Remedias. Yeah? So, so we're, we're, going to, we're going to answer directly that question. But before we get that, we, we've got this uh, overhead percentage question. And, and one of the things I find interesting um, is that uh, every two years, the Charity Commission go out with a, uh, you know, with a questionnaire. What are, what are the, what, what's the general public's biggest concern with charities? And with 36% of the vote at the moment, it's charity overheads. Um, the public are concerned about charity overheads more than anything. So here's a question for you, yeah? If the public are concerned about this, do you know what your overhead percentage is? So hopefully this Slido will work. Uh, Marcus, do you, do, you wanna, do you wanna load the yeah. Slido in and then we'll just give it to everybody to have a go and give us an answer back? So, so, so what you- just- pasted a link into the chat box and if you click on that link that should take you to the um to the relevant poll that you can then click on and and fill out um with with your answers alternatively I've, as i've said there go to slido.com and then if you use hashtag mksfm that will take you to the poll as well so we've got 16 17 and counting participants so far and initially we had um uh, I'm not sure was the leading. So the options are yes, I have a rough idea, and I'm not sure. And initially, I'm not sure was taking the lead, but now nearly half of the people have said yes, um, I know what my overhead percentage is, with um, just under a third saying they have a rough idea, and about a quarter saying saying I'm not sure. So we'll give that a couple more seconds to run. Yeah, and also, Marcus, if, if people have comments, I mean, you know, that they want to type into the... Into the um, the chat box here, you know, it, it, it's also good yeah. fun for us to, you know, or, or helpful for us because when we can answer your questions as you come along. So, so, so yeah. feel free, feel free to, um, you know, to actually put comments in here as, as well. Yeah. Okay. It's now Marcus, what, almost what's, neck what's the and neck. On the doors? I, have, I have a rough idea has just, just taken the lead. So if I press stop now that we've hit 50 people, we had there, um, thirty-three percent have said have said yes, they know their overheads. Thirty-five percent have said they have a rough idea, and thirty-three percent said I'm not sure. So, so this let's just stop there and and just think 
you know, this is the biggest thing that the public are concerned about. It's money that you should have in your pockets to do the work that you are, are doing. And yet when we look at the overall percentage, there's a large percentage of charities on this call, yeah, who, who don't know their overheads or, or aren't sure, yeah. That's really, that's really interesting. So, so we're going to try now in the rest of this. And by the way, that's typically what we see in the sector. I was just about to say, yeah. <laughs> th so, it's basically almost exactly a third, a third, a third. Yeah. And, and that's, what we, that's what we see is a third of all organizations just have no clue what their overheads are. A third are absolutely excellent at it and are very, very good and very focused on it. And a third just need a bit of, a bit of help. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's what we're, we're, going, to, we're going to give you. Um, so, so, you know, he, he, here's the thing. What, what are the issues that Marcus and myself typically see before we dive into the detail? Um, the first is that there's a technical gap. Um, people don't understand what overheads are, um, or they don't understand what support costs are, or they don't understand how to cost things, or they don't have a model for cost recovery. It's all of those things which we're going to badge as technical knowledge, you know, and, and actually that's quite easy to solve because if people have got you know, basic level of management information, it's easy to solve the technical knowledge. You just teach and go. Um, the second problem that we really see is management information, you know, where, where management information is either not strong enough or, or missing or takes a, a long time to come out. Um, you know, the commercial sector is typically saying five days to close at the end of the month. The charity sector, from what I see, is typically or from what I see is typically taking about three to four weeks. Yeah, that's that's a huge difference in terms of getting management information for decisions. So, so management information is is really the second one. But the biggest one we see is the third is this culture piece is the fact that everybody just points to the finance team and says, actually, it's, it's, it's them who does cost recovery. It's finance problem. It's not. It, it, it's across all different areas, operations, fundraising you know, finance, that's why this is such a powerful conversation to bring everybody together. The fourth um, issue is that information is held as cost centers rather than services or activities. So do you see that, that the, the, the costs in the information in, in, in the ledgers are held as, I don't know, salaries, um, and then held as travel and uh, held as, I, I don't know, equipment, but it doesn't say what those things are for. So it doesn't talk about what the activities are. Um, that leads us into business models, you know, and I, and I think probably 20% of organizations don't really understand their business models. And so helping organizations to really think deeply about how they make their income and how they spend their income is, is uh, another one of, of the issues that we see. And then the final one is, is a strange um, uh, thing for cost recovery. It, it, it's where you've got a gap. Um, and you look to next year and you say, we've got an idea that we want to grow and we need the additional resource to be able to grow, but we haven't put it into the budgets. Oh, we've looked historically at the budgets. Well, if, if you were always at this side and you're using the budgets from before, you're never going to make that step change. So helping people to have the confidence to look forward and to use future budgets, you know, future forecasts is, is very powerful to address some of the cost recovery gaps and cost recovery issues. Back to you, Marcus. Perfect. I'm just good. We've had a couple of questions in where people have said, um, when I'm talking about percentage of overheads, what, what exactly are we talking about? And uh, just to be clear that we're saying, OK, as a percentage of your total costs, what portion of those are, are, your, are your overheads? Um, so I hope that that answers that from, from the two people, Lisa and Natasha, who both asked that question. So this here is an example of this again is a is a, a, a redoctored but a real example of, of an ex client of ours. Um, and this is a real example of internal transparency or, or a lack thereof. Um, so in this instance here, you've got direct costs, which which are what we're calling um, direct costs, the costs that link to the activity or service. Um, You've got the uh, direct support costs, which are those um, messy costs where, uh, like a building, it may partially relate to service one, it may partially relate to service three. And so it needs to be um, apportioned out between the two of them. 
And then we've got at the bottom those at the bottom right, that orange box, the indirect costs or the overheads. So these are the costs that don't link to the work that you do, but are part of the um, general infrastructure of your organization. And so we're going to be using indirect costs and overheads interchangeably, but just to let you know that those are meaning the same thing. Now, this example here shows each different service um, with a contribution figure at the bottom. So service one has its 100,000 income. You've got some, some direct costs there in, the, in the, blue, the blue box. And then you've got those direct support costs, those slightly messy ones that you've had to do a bit of work with. And service one has got a almost 13,000 pound profit. Happy days. Service two is doing even better at nearly 20,000. Service three is making 14. In fact, the only um, service that isn't making a profit in this, in this scenario is workshops, conferences, and training, which is making an 18,000 pound loss. And each of these different service managers will be looking at their services in this regard and going, great, happy days, I'm making a profit except for workshops, but that's okay because everything else is, is making money. However, what they should really be doing is taking those indirect costs and overheads and apportioning them across those different services to reach the true cost of, the, um, of those different services. Because those overheads, while not linking to those, um, to those different services and to the, to the charitable work that they are doing, they are still a crucial part of, um, of undertaking those services. It's very hard to undertake a, um, a home health service, for example, if you don't have um, a rostering system or if you don't have finance doing all of, all of the billing that's going on in the background, etc. They're not a, um, a direct cost, but it's still an important part of, um, of the work. So what this charity could have done instead is it's the next step is then taken those overheads and allocated them across the different services. But interestingly, that takes service one from being a, a healthy, profitable service to actually being a loss making service. And service two, having been the most profitable of all the services, is now only making a five thousand pound profit or a surplus. Now, this is just showing that the, the true cost of what the different services are costing may actually be different from what you really think. And that when you include all of the relevant costs to them, that it might actually be a, be a different picture. So despite it looking like each of the services on the previous slide is making a profit, actually, as a whole, the organization is making a loss here because those overheads are really um, uh, clawing back all of that, those contributions being made by the different services. And so, um, you know, Marcus and myself now have, have spent two years um, doing cost recovery work. Before that, I'd, I'd spent what eighteen years. You know, so so this is this is the combined information probably from about one hundred and fifty odd cost recovery reviews, and this is what we believe charities fail to count. And and the single the single biggest thing you can do as organisations to get proper cost recovery, yeah, is to have a pro forma template, yeah, and to have that signed off. So, so the single biggest thing that you can do is have a pro forma template and get that signed off. And in that pro forma template, this is what people typically forget about. They forget about the marketing, brand, advocacy, awareness, fundraising, and trading costs, all of those costs in the top left hand there. They forget about business development costs, uh, general costs of property, working capital, irrecoverable VAT, and then the general overheads you'd expect, IT, HR, finance, legal, quite often they're cherry picked. In other words, we, we pick the cost to, to make the budget fit, not work out what the actual cost is yeah, and whether we're prepared to subsidize that. Uh, impact measurement, I think, I think there's an endemic problem that we're not uh, putting aside the money for impact, uh, capturing data outputs and outcomes, monitoring and evaluation, uh, and costs of turning learning into practice, this beautiful word, TULIP. Uh, also, costs of R&D. Well, if you don't do R&D, how, how do you tell if your work is, is is right for the future? How do, you, how do you ask those difficult questions? For those that have CQC and regulation costs, we quite often about those. And then a cost of uh, being part of a, a larger organization like, uh, you know, Age UK, for example, have a brand cost. And the final thing is the cost of volunteers. Um, it's interesting, some of the volunteer organizations that we've been working with, um, they're seeing that their volunteers cost twice the amount of money than, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's actually on a full-time employment. Um, you know, if you look at, for example, St. John's Ambulance, uh, they're quite open in saying it costs them more to have volunteers 
but they would never change that model because that's part of what they do. Yeah. So, so these are the things that charities fail to count, um, which actually, if you have a pro forma, you, you won't forget. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, very quickly, there's a question from Chris Dove, who very aptly said on this slide here, it depends on how you allocate the overheads, doesn't it? And yes, that's true. Although, however you decide to allocate these overheads, the organization is still a loss-making organization. And it's important to be able to view these services in their totality, that the cost of those overheads or those indirect costs has to um, be borne somewhere. Um, and so putting it against the different services gives you an idea of what the different services need to be bringing in in order to be a um, surplus-making um, organization as a whole. So the, the way it's been done in this particular example is um, as a percentage of, of direct costs. So the, the bigger the direct cost in the blue box, the bigger um, that figure there, the, the larger the um, amount of overhead those different services have taken. So, as Mark said, using using a template um, is the single single best way that, that that we know to to be better at recovering your costs. If you are counting all of them in a um, in an accurate manner by having a template that has a line for every single one of your organization's costs, you're not going to be missing out, and you have a you have a better chance of recovering some of them. So now we're going to look at this is what we would typically do with an organization in cost recovery. So we first of all go down all of an organization's different costs and we go, OK, what are your direct costs? What are your direct support costs, your messy costs? And then what are your indirect costs? And the I suppose the art to, to this comes um, which is in answering that um, that earlier question at the start of saying, what if you have 20% overheads, but a uh, funder will only take 12% as an example. The art here, I suppose, is about trying to take as many of what you were traditionally calling overheads and saying, OK, how many of these costs actually link to the work that we do? So premises is a cost that we find most often gets lumped into overheads because it's a it's a difficult time consuming messy task splitting out premises costs into where it should really be sitting but if you take that time to do it you might be saying okay 20 percent of our building is used for service one another 40 percent of our building is used for service two leaving only 40 percent of our building left that's actually used as an overhead to house finance and hr and if you do that, you've just moved 60% of your building's costs, which is normally a pretty large cost within an organization. You've just moved 60% of that cost out of your overheads. And yes, that cost has to sit somewhere. And so that 20% is sitting in service one and that 40% is sitting in service two. But the percentage of your overheads has just come down. So you may have moved closer towards that 12% that you know a funder will be giving, um, even if the actual uh, total figure that you're asking for is the same. It's um, it's about saying that more of that cost is actually service delivery cost is direct cost, and less of it is is overhead. Um, as it says there, we, there needs to be a balance in this though. Um, we've we've worked with organisations before who've said, yeah, we have 1.4 percent overheads, and as a, as an organisation of you know around a, a million pound turnover a year you look at it and go, I'm not sure that I believe you there. And if if they went to any funder and said, yes, we have 1.4% overheads, I think in interest of transparency that we've just said is the, the kind of the crucial thing to take away from here. If you're going in with an unrealistically low percentage of overheads, um, you're not being transparent to a funder. And a funder is going to see here that you have simply tried to move all of your costs up, up above that line. So it's about finding that balance, um, moving up what you can, what genuinely links to the work that you do and what shouldn't be an indirect cost, um, but not moving absolutely everything to make yourselves appear unrealistically lean as, as organizations. And at the bottom there, it says, uh, including, including a profit element for pricing, which we're gonna come on to later when we start talking about pricing, pricing versus costing. And this is a, a thing that we so often see with with charities where um, when we're trying to talk about what a service costs people will very often 
take you back to what they get in as a, as a grant or what they get in as a contract for that particular service. And that difference between costing and pricing is really, really important, particularly where you have a service that is that is making a loss. Because if you are simply looking at the pricing side of things, you're losing track of what you're spending, what your costs are. And if you're not counting all of those, then you, you find yourselves in a situation like the example we talked about before, where you suddenly have a £36,000 loss that needs funding from somewhere. Um, but as I said, we'll come on to um, to pricing in, in more detail later. So as a next Slido question, we've got another little um, little spot quiz. We are going to say, can you think of costs currently counted as overheads within your organizations that should be char charged to services? And I'm just going to paste the and, link and back into while, the group. While Marcus, is, while Marcus is painting that list, I mean, you know, a, a list of things that we, we typically find are buildings, uh, insurance. So in other words, yeah. insurance just gets lumped in one as, a, as an overhead, whereas you might have just taken on that insurance purely for that program. Yeah. Um, you know, training. Uh, Training is another one. Absolutely. IT is is, is, is typical where you, you, you've got, for example, a database which you're holding for some of the work, but then people will just lump that database which is being held for that project, only for that project, and they'll just put it straight into IT, central IT costs. Yeah. What, what, what else can you think of, Marcus? Um, we had, had a whole number. There were particular examples where you might um, uh, recruitment costs, for example, if you're only recruiting for one particular uh, slot for a, for a service, if that service goes away, you don't have that recruitment cost. That is a part of delivering that service is finding the right people to, to undertake that work. Um, but most often than not, HR recruitment all gets gets put into overheads. Um, and looking here at the at the results, we've got 34 participants so far, 36. We've got only 6%, 5% now have said no, they um, cannot think of costs currently counted as overheads that could be charged to services. So that shows that you know, almost, almost everyone who has, who has answered this has thought at least a couple or yes lots of, um, of costs that could be moved above that line um, to, to try and reduce your overhead percentage and to link more and more of your work to your services. So, so I, I was going to say there's some great questions coming in here, Marcus. Yeah, there's a wonderful one from Wendy Leyland um, saying the moving overheads above the line is quite a grey area. Who decides what's reasonable? The auditors? Absolutely not. Yeah, it's, it's not the auditors who decide. It's, it's you as a management team and you as an organisation. And this is the thing. You have one opportunity with the auditors to get this right. And you know, putting forward what you think is the right framework and working with the auditors to put that in place is, is, a, very, is a very powerful thing. In other words, you'll mm. get their expertise at the same time as, um, you know, uh, making sure that you're recovering the, the most money. Um, Moises, uh, Jomaron, I mean, you, you're, you're saying that it's, it's it, you know, the cost structure doesn't always match the donors. That's mm. absolutely correct, yeah? And, and one of the arts, especially in international development, is having to manipulate budgets back to the donor, but you have to start with your own rules. Yeah, as soon as you yeah. start with a donor rule, you, you've lost you've lost the plot, if you like. You've lost the 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 start of being analytical and transparent because you'll never be you never get the same thing twice. In other words, if you're going to use a donor rule as your base, you'll distort your organisation. Have your own rules, and then you can see, for example, uh, the EC won't pay for internal audit costs. Are you prepared to actually pick up that tab for them? Question mark. Yeah. yeah. And any other question? Any other points that you want to make, Marcus? Or shall I? No, I, I I totally agree with that. Of saying that you know, if if you're not, if you're instantly working from the donors' rules, you're never going to see a true picture of the cost thing because you're already cherry picking, um, as as we showed in that earlier slide. So, starting with your own template and then seeing your template and matching that to what the donor donor will allow gives you a much much better um better standing point within your organization of knowing what your costs are but also then being able to go to that donor and saying actually i know you won't allow xyz but even if they're not allowed there's still a cost to us we have a gap now of x that needs to come from somewhere and you then have a, just a, a more transparent negotiation standpoint with them we're gonna we're gonna crack on um very Perfect. quick answer to carl richardson 
uh, does FRS 102 dictate or provide guidance? Actually, there's a very helpful table in FRS 102, um, which shows what a, a good um, support cost note might look like. Um, it doesn't give that guidance as to how you put it in place, but it but it's got some it's got some helpful uh, guidance. It certainly doesn't dictate. Yeah. Um, costing versus pricing. This is where it this is where it gets really quite interesting because if you look at the um, model that Marcus has built here, and you 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 you've got the balance right within direct cost, direct support, and indirect cost. Um, you may want to add a risk or a contingency. You may want to add a surplus you know, on there um, before you come to a price. And do you see that, that, that a cost is not the same as a price? Um, what you might want to actually like sort of subsidize the service because you think it's so important that it takes place. You might actually want to give some of your unrestricted reserves to that. In other words, you don't achieve full cost recovery, but that's fine. You're, you're doing that um, because you, it's so strategically important and you're going to use your unrestricted reserves in that way. Also, um, don't don't forget, donors don't always want you to be sustainable when they're giving a grant. They expect you sometimes to have a, a you know a platform that you operate from. Um, and so, for example, the the lottery, national lottery, in the old days, this was what twenty odd years ago, used to say we would like to spend uh, you know use our money in the widest possible way. Um, you know, therefore, we're going to make a marginal contribution. We're only going to give you the project costs, excluding the overheads. Thankfully, that's changed. Yeah. But some some funders don't want to give you full overheads. I respect that. But being able to have um, a transparent idea how much it costs is important. Um, contingency in the government green book, it says that you can put in a contingency. Um, I would say typically a contingency on those things are where you've got a new project, something that you haven't done before, where you're trying to try something which is risky. You, you know, 10 to 15 percent, uh, maybe 7 to 10 percent if you don't feel comfortable with 10 to 15 percent. That sort of level is the right sort of contingency. And then profit, surplus, whatever you want to call this. It's a really contentious area. I, I would typically say, uh, you know, I've seen some charities have 7 percent, you know, profit. Some have 15 percent. Um, it, it, it's difficult to know what you would put out you know, as a surplus figure. But if you think sometimes, for example, Age UKs are in competition with Virgin Health, um, they may be making between 15 and 30 percent profit. And a lot of the work that I've done around pricing, for example, in sport and in gyms, charities are competing against gyms that are typically making 35 percent profit. Yeah. So actually just challenging internally your board, it's hard, though, in COVID-19 world, but just challenging people to say, should we actually have a profit? element in there if it's a contract you know a contract that, that that's really important um so calculating day rates is the next question we're going to ask you and the question that we've got really is is to try and find out from the people in the virtual room here um how many days you would cost your contracts over so if you're taking a day rate and you've got a large number of days, let's say 365, you get a relatively small rate. Do you see that? Yeah. Whereas actually, if you've got, um, you know, a rate and you put it over 180 days, you get a lot more cost recovery. You get, you know, 50 percent more, 100 percent more. Yeah. So Marcus has put up the Slido. And here's the question, the final question for you. How many days do you use to calculate your day rates? You know, when you're working out day rates in a in a in a contract or, or a grant. And so we're we're over to you and the slido again. Uh, we'd like to see your answers. So we've got seven people so far. Um, and the, the things that we put up is 365, 260, 220, 200. I mean, Marcus, how how are the how are the numbers looking? At the moment we've got half of the um, results are saying 220 days. With a pretty even spread, um, we've got nearly 20% of people saying 365 days at the moment, but that percentage is dropping as more and more people answer. Um, quite a few uh, 260 days, and at the moment, just under 10% are saying even lower than 200. Um, at the yeah, 220 days is the is the clear majority, with then 365 and 260 both being the next most popular. Um, so we're seeing here that a lot of organizations are using a, a high number of days um, that they're splitting their day rates over. To 
quickly come back to we had a couple of um questions on the earlier bits while we give um people a you know a, a few more seconds to to answer the slido um sandra said do auditors need to approve our methodology though um some some auditors will will want to to see and approve your your methodology but as as you say there the, the key thing is it's it's your methodology and it's agreed by the auditors it's not it's not set by the auditors they are auditing your methodology rather than setting it and so as long as you have a um a clear basis of um being able to justify why you've moved costs in certain ways as we said to to that building being 20 40 60 uh, 20 40 40 that split of building cost if you can justify that cost there's no reason why the auditors would would not approve that methodology so i was going to say marcus that's that's the best return for any slido poll i think we've had we've, we've got 51 answers there and most people are saying 220 days yeah. Do you want to talk us through the next slide then about what what we see in terms of of good practice yeah sure happy happy to do that so here we have deciding on the number of days we've got 365 days in a, in a year um take off your 104 weekends to get to 261 or, or 260 which as we've got we've um had 22 percent of people said they use 260 days but in actual fact your staff are never going to work all of those 260 days you have the bank holidays you have your your statutory holiday you have your um days holiday allowance you have your sick days um, and that number of sick days has slightly reduced now in, in the gig economy, but that takes the number of actual workable days, once you take all of those things out, to, to closer to 220 days. And it's really positive to see that um, that almost half of you are using 220 days to, um, to calculate your day rates on. Um, what we've said there is that actually of those 220 workable days, staff spend a lot of time going on training or going on uh, networking workshops uh, events like this if you're on this you're not um, doing your day job as it were uh, and if you add up all that time that comes to around 10 percent or another 20 days um, bringing you down to 200 days i'm, I'm going to make a slight i'm going to make a go slight it, change Mark. of i'm going to make a slight change of word there yeah um, you know, the training and on charity business is where it, it's, for example, health and safety and things within yep. the charity, that to, you know, that, that you're being you're being asked to do because it's because it's 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 part of a charity's business. Sure. Um, and we've even got in the kind of financial services sectors that both Mark and I worked in back in the day that they more often use um, a percentage utilization. And that percentage is normally around around 80 percent taking them right down to 180 days so by using that lower number of days that you're spreading your your staff's cost over when you're um calculating your day rates you're able to get a substantially larger day rate by using those more realistic and more accurate uh number of days than um, a traditional 365 or 260 days and that takes us on to mark for you to broadly wind us up a little bit and then bring us on to some questions yeah so so um you know i hope i hope you've really enjoyed the the conversation here i mean there's loads of questions that are that are you know firing mm. and, and coming over to us um you know and also people please you know if you need to leave it's it, it's really not a it's really not a problem i mean marcus and myself will stay here uh, yeah. and you know for certainly for a for an amount of time you know just to answer any questions that you have I mean, this is um, the CAS uh, cost recovery tools for success guide uh, that Marcus and myself wrote. I mean, you know, Mark, Marcus and myself settled down and we wanted to put into, our, you know, words what we saw as good practice and also learning. And so, um, you know, we, we, we now both work at Moore Kingston Smith, but, but this is a great tool, um, if you like, to, to talk about, um, you know, cost recovery in exactly the same way as we, we've done here, but it also includes, for example, percentages, average percentages in the country. It also talks about um, comparing, uh, you know, against other sectors, um, you know, commercial organizations, for example. It also talks about, you know, other technical things. So, so it, it's only 23 pages long. We wrote it, so it's a, a very light read. Um, I, I, I hope you find it, I hope you find it useful. Um, so, so that's really that's really it um, in terms of 
you know, the cost recovery piece. I mean, I, I put up some thoughts here. Um, you know, Marcus and myself have, have run so many different workshops before. And I, and I think in, in summary, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's really for me the fact that you've got to know your overheads. And so many organizations we work with don't, don't even do the number crunching to get to the overheads. And there's money to be made from that. And, and we, we see that 5 to 10% uh, recovery is what we can achieve. Um, so, so, for example, uh, in November last year, um, we went to Malawi to go and help a, an NGO over there. Um, they were saying we've got very good cost recovery practices. Um, it was a 16 million US dollar business. When we walked away, Marcus and myself uh, said that they could recover another 2.5 million US dollars. They didn't feel comfortable with that. They said they felt comfortable with recovering 1.5 million US dollars more. And so we left them with that just over 10% extra recovery so that they can do more of the work that they engage in, you know, so the health work that they're engaged with with Africa. Um, I can't think that there's any more, you know, slides there. Marcus, any, any final comments before we just start answering some questions? No, we've, we've got plenty of questions to get stuck into. So let's let's head on into them. Yeah, well, you, you, you grab a question and go for it. And, and I was going to say general knowledge questions are even better for us. So, so if you want to move cost recovery into like a picture round or something like that that's that's fine too yeah um, um go, go for it marcus we have one here that it, it might be worth me trying to very quickly make a poll for where um susanna has said i'd be interested to know how many people have successfully bid for and won tenders or bids including a profit element this is something i haven't considered before and i'm unsure of how grant makers would respond um, okay. So if we uh, uh, move on to another question, I can create a quick poll for that. I, I, I wouldn't, Marcus, because, because, <laughs> because, because there's, a, there's a problem there in, in the word grant versus the word contract and profit. Yeah. yeah. So, so if, you, if you look at the law in terms of charities that we're under, charities exist under trust law. Yeah. So, so money is given in trust. That's the reason why grants should be priced so that you don't make a profit. Yeah. You know, if you go to a, a, a trust funder and you say, actually, I'd like to make a contribution towards reserves, that's that's different. Yeah. Secondly, if you want to include a contingency, that's that's different. And and so, you know, there is an element of, if you like, sort of making a small surplus. But the whole idea of holding money in trust for a grant yeah, is such that you are, um, you know, such that you are making a, a, you know, not a profit nor a loss that you're able to undertake in your business. The problem is when you get a grant, then how do you get the extra money to innovate? How do you get the extra money to change and, and to invest in your organization? And, and so, you know, you, it's almost for, for a grant worth saying to your funder, we will ask for a small contribution to actually replenish, for example, our IT systems and things. That's very different from a contract. Yeah. A contract you should put forward for profits. If you know, there's nothing to stop you doing that. If it, if it says it's an open tender, put forward for contingency, put forward for profits. You will not lose on cost as charities. We have very lean overheads as a start. Um, you know, where charities are, are competing against commercial organizations, we, we don't tend to lose on cost. Um, where charities are competing against other charities, that's where we get back to the herd mentality that Marcus said. Yeah? So I'm sorry for stopping you, Marcus, but there was a, there was a twist there no, no. around contracts and grants. And, and I think, as you say there, that we, as charities, we tend not to lose on cost. I think part of that is really being able to uh, explain the, the impact side of things, of tell the story of the work that you're doing better as well, um, so that it's not coming down to a purely financial decision. Um, because so often charities are able to have that better uh, better reach or reach those hardest to reach people that um, that another commercial organization may not be able to do. Um, so being able to really tell that story um, can be really powerful. I've got an interesting point here from someone who has said, um, when we were talking about uh, including all of your costs and including overheads in your different services um, to, to show the true cost of the services, someone said, I'm asked not to do it because it makes the fundraising KPIs look bad. Is there anything you want to, to comment on that? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's a really interesting twist to this all, um, you know, fundraising yeah. ratios. 
because because when you when you're in Canada or you're in Australia, you, you have to have fundraising ratios, and if you if you go over a certain you know fundraising rate or sorry you don't achieve a certain fundraising return on investment, then then you lose your license to, to fundraise. So actually, in, in, in organizations, you know, in, in Canada and Australia, some organizations say, actually, you know what, we can't hold fundraising costs in this model, we're going to we're going to put it aside because it generates a return on investment. And we're going to treat it separately. I, I think I think on the flip side, it's it's interesting to think why you're fundraising. Um, you know, if you're fundraising because you are making money for a specific project, let's say, for example, a, a, a home for, you know, for children with learning disabilities, um, you know, that is where you are fundraising specifically for a cost, specifically for an activity. It's a direct cost. Yeah. And it's not an overhead. You should account for it as such. But if you're raising funds for the general purpose of the charity or, or for example, for advocacy, yeah, or, or uh, building awareness, yeah, you might want to call that an overhead. So, so fundraising is particularly difficult, is, 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 the, is the thing mm. you need to take away. And communication, advocacy, fundraising, they all sit in the same bucket. You have to do some thinking around what you're going to do with that. I hope, it, it, does that answer the question, Marcus, do you think? Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, we have a question from Tom who said, how does it work with membership organizations where arguably all activities are membership services slash core activity? Does everything become direct? So I think in that instance, you not necessarily that um, you still have a finance function, say, who are who are doing work at the background. You still have um, the CEO's time who, that is spent running the organization as a whole and deciding on the new you know, strategic direction for the organization, et cetera. They're not spending all of their time being involved in the actual um, delivery of the membership service. Um, so you, you still have um, an element of overheads there. Your, your percentage may be, may be lower than other organizations, but it's still going to be there. Um, and I think that highlights why it's important to do that exercise of going through all your different costs. And it, and it can be a time consuming exercise, having done that with a number of different charities to go down all your different costs and say, okay, what of our costs links to our work and what doesn't link to our work? What is our actual overhead percentage figure rather than um, using the historic figure that you've used in your reports and accounts because you may come across very different percentages from what you thought it was. Um, there's a there's a large number of questions here. Can we have the slides? Yes, yes. all the slides will be available. Um, I'm going to I'm going to just um, you know at this point in time I'm going to say Marcus and myself will stay for another five minutes of questions or ten minutes of questions. You know we're just happy to carry on. But for those people that are going to want to leave now, I, I you know there was about just over a hundred people uh, on the call. We're down to about eighty five. Some people are dropping off now. Um, the final slide here just basically says what's what's coming up um you know let's stay connected uh next is going to be agile fundraising dan and emma from the fundraising team are going to talk about cases for support for coronavirus and the new normal it's going to be the next webinar we have and i think they've got some special guests for that talk um the next one will be an akivo uh, webinar on the 18th does your charity have an impact-led strategy or are you focused too much on the money and and it's going to be a it's going to be a real thinking, hopefully, with the with the Kivo members. We've got ongoing services, bid writing, cost recovery, impact measurement. If you've got any interest in stakeholder engagement, fundraising, please come to us. We offer slots, surgery slots, and it's our pleasure to offer those to give something back to the to the sector. Um, please get in touch, charity finance at mks.co.uk if you need more from us. Um, the final thing is to say that. Uh, on the left hand, sorry, on the right hand side here are all the previous webinars, which you can dig into and you can uh, read and learn from. Yeah? yeah. So in other words, you can go and watch uh, the webinars, the previous webinars we've had. Anything else, Marcus, I've missed? I was just going to say that, yes, this webinar is being recorded. So not only will you get the slides, but you'll be able to watch back the full webinar and we will send, be sending out an email to everyone who joined us with, with a link and those that weren't able to make it um, so that if you have a colleague who couldn't make it, they can still um, watch, watch back this webinar.
So, so Marcus and myself are going to stay for another five, ten minutes. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you. I, I, I genuinely hope you use some of the thinking here to go and get more money for your organisations and charities. And if you choose not to take that money, yeah, because actually strategically you don't want to, at least you do that strategically and transparently and you know how much yeah. you're going to subsidise. I mean, Marcus, the final word I, I, I pass on to you. Um, just to say thank you to, to everyone for joining us. And um, as Mark said, you know, the one thing I would take away from this would be uh, transparency. Be, be better at being open with yourselves and your management as to what it really costs you to run your services and also with your funders. Um, even if they're not going to fund that whole um, service cost, at least you're able to have that, um, that open discussion with them. And yes, thank you very much for joining. And for all of those of you that want to stay and ask, ask questions, um, we will be able to get into those now. Thank you. Right. So we, we're going to we're going to carry on. I'm just I'm just getting, um, you know, a couple of, um, you know, thank you messages. Thank you very much indeed for being kind. I've also got Dan who's um, asked how many bones are there in the human body? Yeah. Oh, I do you remember this from yesterday, Mark? We did a pub, we did a team team quiz yesterday evening and um, we I had cheated. a tiebreaker because it was neck and neck. And on the tiebreaker, Mark sought outside help to answer the how many bones are in the human body. And so he uh, he lost off the back of it. Oh, 206. 206. 206. Isn't it? <laughs> so so, so let, let's go back into the question so that we, we, we yeah. make the most use of our time. We're, we're going to give another five minutes. We've got uh, a couple of minutes. people who have yeah. asked about um, uh, VAT and the, the treatment of VAT and irrecoverable VAT and whether that should be. Um, charged directly to the service or kept as a um, uh, as a general overhead it's it's really it's really difficult because irrecoverable vat is something that charities will stand some donors will accept that some won't so for so for example with diffid we could never claim vat but when we were working with other donors yeah we could we could easily claim that vat back yeah. um you know, there is always a partial exemption or, or calculation which you can do to recover some of that back, but it's typically very low. Um, I would say, I would say, on on uh, average, going back and talking to your donor, your trust fund, your foundation is the way to get those funded. Um, as I say, some some of the big, you know, government agencies, it's actually not legal for them to offer. VAT, whereas a lot of the private agencies that you work with, especially corporate organisations that are giving you donations, they can recover the VAT. They're very happy to, to, mm -hmm. to give it to you. Yeah. Um, there's also a, a very a strange twist here as well, which is, for example, with animal welfare organisations, where you've got VAT, for example, on uh, veterinary supplies, which can be recovered. Um, sometimes you can actually ask the donor um, to uh, waive uh, VAT and to give you, uh, you know, so, uh, an additional amount of money that can be recovered on their behalf. Yeah. So, so find a good VAT practitioner. Find somebody at MKS who can talk much more sense about VAT than I can. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a good chance you can recover that unless it's something like a government agency where it, it, it's 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 not legal to do that. Yeah. Um, Barbara has asked. Uh... I'm an Akiva member, but can't find the webinar on the 18th of June. Do we register by MKS or Akiva? It may be that Akiva simply haven't um, put up the um, advertised for that webinar yet. So I'm sure it will be available through, through them. But equally, we will be sending an email out as we have for all of our other ones um, to be able to register for that. So I suppose watch this space for from both us and, and Akiva. So, so there's a great question from Karen. This is this is this is a this is a cracking question from Karen Duncan, um, and yeah. it, it, it's it's a question that is often asked. Do do you work, um, if you like, cost recovery from the top, in other words, umbrella, or do you work it from a from a project upwards? Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what I would say is, first of all, in the first instance, so you make sure you count all costs. Yeah, um, you you calculate from the top down. In other words, you look at the holistic organization and you calculate your costs within that. Um, it, the problem is if you if you cost by a project, you tend to cherry pick your costs. Yeah. I mean, Marcus, you, you, you've certainly seen that before in organizations where 
you know, for, for example, we're working with one at the moment where they're looking for a template. I mean, please. Yeah. I, I think by by doing it on a project by project basis, it's very easy for certain projects to go, oh, that cost doesn't apply to us, move it out. The next the next project goes, oh, that also doesn't apply to us. And so you suddenly go through it on a project by project basis and realize that you've got a whole lot of costs at the end of it that just haven't been included in any of them because each of them has kind of not taken ownership of it and has kind of lumped it onto the next one. So one um, plus side to doing an organization wide version is that you're being consistent across all of your projects. Um, it makes sure that you are actually counting everything and not, um, otherwise you have the the managers of each of the different projects wanting to, you know, move as much cost out of theirs as possible. I, I, I have only got one question left on the list. It's Mari Palmer. Um, please could you repeat the source of the good example for a support cost note in the accounts? It's actually in sort, Mari. And so if you go to the sort, and I can't remember the reference, I'm not that geeky, I'm so sorry. Um, you, you will be able to find the support cost note in there, which is actually a good, a good quality example. Um, we have no questions left on the rail. I think then we're going to take any, maybe one more question if somebody has one more, and then we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. I'm going to say going once, going twice. <laughs> gone uh there's no more questions Perfect. we're gonna say thank you so much yeah and yep. um it's good night from me and it's good night from <laughs> thank you very from... much take care much love thank you very much indeed bye, -bye. thank you bye